All right, so this, this chapter is called Analytic Trigonometry. It's like the algebra side of trigonometry. Last chapter is like the geometry side, right? Turning it into a picture or a graph. This is the algebraic side. So um, it's our last chapter of trigonometry. Um, now this, this unit is kind of notorious for um, being pretty hard, I think. Um, but I think in the third year of teaching trig, I found a way to kind of make it a little more accessible to you guys. And basically what I'm going to do is we're going to take it slow and we're also going to break it up into smaller chunks. So what I'm going to do is we're not going to have one big unit 12 test. Instead, I'm going to have two little tests. Okay. Make it a little bit more manageable. Um, so I'm glad you guys are here. It's a sad thing that today's senior ditch day because... You know, you don't want to, this is kind of a bad chapter to miss, but hopefully they'll, they'll watch the video and figure it out. I'll send out a reminder tonight to ask them to watch it. Um, anyway, we're, today's lesson is these things called identities, okay? Um, and so we're going to be using those to simplify expressions. That's pretty much it. So let's get started. So what is an identity? It's an expression that is equivalent or identical to another expression. So, for instance, uh, 2 times x minus 1 is the same thing as 2x minus 2, right? If you just distribute, you can show that it's exactly the same. Or x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equivalent to or an identity of x plus 1 times x plus 1 because if you factor the one on the left, you get the one on the right. So that's what an identity is. Basically, it's just another way to rewrite something uh, in a different way. And why, why would we want to do that? Well, you guys kind of already know the answer to that, believe it or not. One reason why is we do it to simplify expressions. So this guy here, right? If I were to factor the top, it looks like this, which allows me to reduce the x plus 1s, and I end up with something a lot simpler. Okay? So these two expressions are pretty much equivalent with an exception, but um, that's the idea. Another way is solving equations. So like this, you can't really get x by itself when it looks like this, so we have to factor it first, and then we can solve for x, right? So the point is if you can rewrite something, you can either simplify or solve when it's rewritten differently. So that's why we do that. Now these are all just algebra examples, but I'm going to show you that you can do this sort of stuff with trig expressions as well, okay? Um, there's already some identities that you guys are aware of that we're going to use today, um, and the first set is these guys. You're already aware of these ones. Like, you're aware that sine is the reciprocal of cosecant and vice versa, right? And cosine is reciprocal of secant and vice versa. Um, and you're also aware of this one. Just so you guys know, in this chapter, I, I, I wanted to have these on your notes just so you can look at them, but you might want to like just put a little X through those two on that sheet that I handed out to you because we probably won't be using those ones. There are so many identities in trig, it's ridiculous. A lot of times when you buy a trig book, they, they, they give like the last two, like, bless you. The inside cover, those two whole pages are filled up with all these different identities you could use. I, we're not going to be learning that many. We're only going to be learning a few. And those are the ones that you really need to kind of do most of the stuff that you ever need to do. The other ones are kind of like, uh, you barely see them. So we're not going to waste our time on those. Um, but there's a lot. <clears throat> so we have these ones. Here's one that um, you may not be aware of yet. This is on that big sheet as well. That big sheet that I printed for you, by the way, is like a reference sheet. We'll probably be using it for all of Unit 12. Um, these are called the quotient identities. So this one we, we haven't learned officially yet, but I'll prove to you on the next slide here. I'm going to prove to you that tangent is actually sine over cosine. Now, you don't need to write this slide, but if you're a math person and you like proofs and seeing why things are the way they are, you can write it down, but I'm not going to test you on anything like this. But as a math teacher, I hate to just give a formula and not explain why it's true. So I'm going to prove to you guys why is tangent equal to sine over cosine. So speaking of the unit circle, let's go back to that for a second.
we have our angle, right? And it gives us a point on the unit circle, and that point has a certain height, which gives us basically our y value, and it has a certain base or length away from the uh, y axis, which is our x value. So you get a point out of that, right? And something else that we talked about is that x is cosine, right? Remember that? Yes, Mr. Green. Ooh. Yes, we do. Oh, nice. I don't. Really talking about something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just doing some history. All right, and then y is sine, right? All right, let's talk about y is tangent sine over cosine. Well, as you, this should be theta. Sorry. Um, tangent. You guys remember tangent is what over what? Uh, opposite over adjacent right oh, yes. and so you're you're getting there so it's opposite over adjacent so what's opposite from this angle y. and adjacent x so it is y over x but y is what sine, sine. and x is oops x so there you go tangent is sine over cosine and as you guys know, cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent, right? So basically, I can just flip this over and get this. So there you go. That, that's why the quotient identity is true. Um, we're going to be spending the day using the reciprocal and quotient identities to simplify expressions. That's the goal. Okay. All right. Ow. I don't see pencils moving, so I think we're okay. That hurts. Where are you writing? Oh, the one person I couldn't see. All right. Sorry about that. I'll pause for smoking. Go ahead and copy down this one. Now, I'm calling this strategy one, but it, it's really example one. Okay? So this is example one, but I'm calling it strategy. All right. Here you go. So um, I want to give you guys a... a Big picture view of where we're going with this. So the it's the directions say prove that this equals this. So essentially I'm gonna be simplifying this side until it looks like that. That's the idea. Um, you don't need to write this, but I just want to show you. So like these two things, once again, we had this up earlier. If I if I said prove that these things are the same, what you do is you would distribute, right? And as soon as you got them to look exactly the same, oops, you would say, okay, good, they're the same. That's it. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to mess around with this side doing some algebra and putting identities in there until they actually end up looking exactly the same. Um, that's the goal. Why do we do that? Once again, it helps solving the equation. It also helps simplify expressions. Um, before I begin the problem, though, I want to talk about this first right here. Um, this means that I'm squaring secant x, all right? But you may be tempted to write it like this, but that's not true. Those are different things. You guys see the difference is where the 2 is located. In this case, what you're doing is is you're squaring the whole function. You're squaring, you're plugging something into secant and then you're taking the result of that and then squaring the result. Over here you're squaring the x and that's what you're plugging into the secant. So they're different things. Um, but what I will be doing, because this is kind of weird, um, we usually do put this, the, the two at the end, right, when we're squaring something. And so I, just to kind of keep things looking normal, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but what I'm going to do is I am going to write it like this, but I'm going to put parentheses, and that makes it actually okay. Okay? Because that means I'm squaring the whole thing. So just be aware of that. And so that's going to be the first thing I do, is I'm going to actually just rewrite this like that.
once again, you don't have to. If it's just easy for you to remember what this means and you don't need to rewrite it, then don't worry about it. But I'm going to do that just to make it look a little bit more familiar. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply this strategy. We're going to change everything to sine or cosine in order to prove that the left side is the same thing as the right side. So here we go. Let's apply the strategy. The strategy is change everything to sine and cosine. So is this a sine or a cosine? No. No. So we need to rewrite that. So I want you guys to look at that big sheet that I gave you. I want you to find where it tells us what secant equals. What does secant equal? 1 over cosine. Don't forget your square. It's still there. Oh, oops. We could do the cotangent also because cotangent is not cosine or sine either, right? So we need to rewrite that. So look on your big sheet where it says cotangent, and what does cotangent equal? I heard some mumbling. I'll assume you guys said this. Is this what you guys said? What? No. Should be. I said one over Oh, that's true. We crossed that box off, though, because we won't be using it. That's a true statement, but we won't be using that. So cosine over sine. You guys see that one? Okay. How about this one over here? Is this cosine or sine? So we're going to leave it alone. I will put it over 1 just so it's a fraction like the others, but I'm not going to rewrite it. How about cosecant? So that's the strategy I want to share with you guys first, is rewriting everything as sine and cosine. And that, that's, that's a big part of the work. From here, basically, we're just going to simplify this until they look the same. Okay? So, um, I'm going to square here. So, what's 1 squared? And cosine squared looks like this, right? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply all the way across the top here. What is 1 times cosine? cosine. And what's cosine times cosine? cosine. It's cosine squared. So if I multiply all these together, I get cosine is squared, right? On the bottom, what's 1 times sine? And then sine times cosine, you can't really mix those, so they're just going to stay separate. So all I've done is I've multiplied the tops together and bottoms together, right? And now at this point, something might be standing out to you. There it is. These reduce out, right? Cosine divided by cosine is 1. So, what's left on the left side now? 1 over sine x. And what's on the right side? And I know that I'm done because why? They're exactly the same. So what I've done is I've shown you that by applying identities and simplifying, you can show that these two sides are actually exactly the same expression. In other words, if you were to come up here and plug in, like, let's say, pi over 2 for x, you would get the same exact answer on the left as you would if you just plugged in pi over 2 over here. They're exactly the same expression. Okay? Um, so there it is. So the strategy is to rewrite everything as sine and cosine, and then simplify until they look exactly the same. And once again, we do that because it helps us solve and simplify. So let's go ahead and jump forward to a student practice here. Uh, I'm going to have you guys do number one. You don't need to do number two. Yes, but you're going to make it look simpler. You are. All right, let's do it. Um, so... First thing is first. Um, Sal, tangent, what am I going to write here? 
sign of the perfect Good. Um, this one here, I like to rewrite it like this, but you don't need to necessarily. And also, I'll put it over one. But notice I'm not changing the cosine into anything because cosine is good as is. Let's, uh, let's move on to Gabby. Gabby, what am I going to replace secant with? Good. And Annette, what am I going to replace sine with? Sine. Sine of a double. Good. You just leave it the same. You can put it over one if you want to. That's fine. All right. One is needed on the top of a fraction, but it's not me on the bottom. Now I put mine on one here so it can mix with these other ones well. All right. Let's see. Carson. <laughs> If I multiply all the way across on the top, Carson, what would I have? Uh, sin x times uh, cos x squared. Cool. Um, Angelisa, if I multiply it all the way across on the bottom, what would I have? Okay. And Griselda, what's next? And at this point, I'll go ahead and drop the over one, but they look exactly the same now. So we're, we've proven that the two sides are equivalent. You made the tail side. I wouldn't do that. How did I do that? You didn't do that. Oh, sorry. All right. Let's do. Strategy two. Go ahead and write down this one. Okay. So a good question that somebody asked me on my other blocks today was, how do you know when to use each strategy? Well, strategy one, we're always going to do it, if you can. There, there'll be like an exception, but for the most part, we're always going to do strategy one. So the first thing I'm going to do on this problem is I'm going to change everything to sine and cosine. Okay. Now strategy two and three, which we'll get to next time, those ones are iffy, just depends. And I'll, I'll tell you how you can tell when you're going to do this. Um, I'm calling this one simplifying complex fractions. Do you guys remember what a complex fraction is? It's, yeah, fractional. Yeah, it's, it's when you have fractions inside of fractions. So how do you know when you're going to do this strategy? When you see a fraction inside of a fraction, you're going to do this strategy. That's how you'll know. But you'll see it when we get there. Right now, all I see is one fraction. I don't see fractions inside of fractions. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, so I'm going to rewrite my bottom like this because that's how I prefer it to be written. Okay. So once again, strategy one is first. <laughs> permission to kick Riley out of class. I was already I was doing this. I was already doing this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to rewrite cosecant, right? We don't like cosecant. So cosecant is what? How would I rewrite that? One over sine x. Yeah. So I'm going to replace this cosecant on the top with one over sine x. And I'm also going to replace the one on the bottom with 1 over sine x, right? And now you guys see the complex fraction, right? Yeah. So strategy 1 still applies. We'll pretty much always do that. It sure is. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do this as well here. Let me square my 1 over sine x. So I'll show some arrows here. I'm just going to go ahead and distribute that in there, so to speak. The top is going to stay the same. The bottom will be 1 squared is 1, and sine x squared is 
sine x squared. We haven't begun the new strategy yet. We see that we need to do it, but we haven't actually done it yet. All right, so I think, I don't know, I think it was on our last review set of old math review for, remember that, unit 11 review test? Um, how do we how do we handle these? What do we do with them? Times everything by the, um, the you multiply everything by the bottom. So I've got two denominators up here that I want to get rid of. I want to get rid of sine of x and sine of x squared. And I have always recommended to multiply by the one that is bigger because it will cancel more stuff. So um, for the sake of the notes, I'm, I'm going to actually rewrite this and show my work. But really, if I was just solving this, I would work right off of where I'm at now. But for the sake of your notes, I would encourage you to rewrite it here so you can see where you came from before you got to this next step. So this is where we're at right now, right? But now we're going to multiply everything by sine of x squared. So... And since I'm multiplying fractions, I might as well make it a fraction. So sine of x squared over 1. Same thing here. And for some reason, it's very tempting to forget about this. But don't forget, you also need to multiply that 1 by sine of x squared. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we get to simplify this stuff. What happens here? Sine of x squared over 1 times 1 over sine of x squared. And you're left with nothing but 1 on the bottom, right? All right. How about here? What's 1 times sine of x squared? All right. And how about here, sine of x squared times 1 over sine of x? Sine of x. For those of you guys that might not see it, just remember, like, if you have x squared over x, the x on the bottom takes one of the x's away on the top, so you're still left with an x, right? Same thing here. If you have sine of x squared over sine of x, the sine of x will take one of these sine of x's away and reduce that power by 1. So now it's just sine of x. All right, the right side looks like this. All right, and from here I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what, what do you think we can do. Sure. Yeah, so first of all, well, let's distribute. So what is sine of x times sine of x? That's sine of x squared, and sine of x times 1 is? Sine of x, right? Now let's look over here. Do I really need the 1? No. And these two things. You can reverse those because it's what? Ooh. Commutative, but big word. Good. I, that's cool that you remember those words. It's commutative. Now we could switch these around because it's addition, right? If it's subtraction, you cannot do that, just so you know. Okay, with addition you can. So I've got them to be the same. There it is. So we had a few things in there, like that distribution step. I actually don't see that happen very often, but there it is. Um, we rewrote it as 1 over sine, so it goes to But that's all stuff that is kind of like water under the bridge for us. This is the step that I really want you guys to make sure you're cool with here is that thing when you have a fraction inside of a fraction to multiply it out to simplify it. Um, the reason why I need to teach that as a strategy is because since we are replacing things with sine and cosine, you end up with fractions inside of fractions. So it's worth focusing on how to deal with that. All right. Um, I'm going to have you guys do number two this time. There you go. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace secant with 1 over cosine. I am. I'm over here doing just to make All right. Um, Abby. Abby, what's next? Multiply everything by the denominator, which in this case is cosine. All right. And then Tavaye, what's cosine? Times one over cosine. <laughs> no, it's cosine times one over cosine is one. It's all right. Um, Tony, we already did this one. Cosine times cosine. That's one also. What's one times cosine, Tony? And then last question is going to go to Tyann. How do I know I'm done, Tyann? Um, That's a good thing. I'm glad you said that. But my question was, how do, you, how do I know I'm done? Yeah, so we can actually stop there. So here's the thing. Sometimes maybe you can go a little bit further, but you don't have to. So long as the sides look identical, you can stop because you've proven they're the same. But I do want to come back to that. Do you guys remember this rule? Can't do that. So like you can't cross these ones off like that. That's a no-no. Just so you guys don't be aware of that. Huh? Why? <laughs> you, yeah, you, you can all, th yeah, there's a few ways you can think about it. Like division cancels multiplication, but it doesn't cancel addition. You can think of it like that. All right. So there it is, guys. We're going to stop there. There was a third strategy I wanted to get to today, but um, it would be a little bit pressed for me to try to squish it in. So we are going to stop a little early today. And uh, I have the homework if you're interested in starting on it. There's only three problems.